Everyone. We'll go ahead and get started this morning by opening God's Word to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And we are just going to be looking at really verse 1. Not going to get too much farther than the opening few words, at least in this first session, and progress on in our second. I'll start by reading those two verses. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Father, your, the psalmist says your mercies are new, each morning, and that is true today in the time in which we live. Mercies that as we've traveled through Romans, Father, attempting to learn these wonderful things that you have provided for us, and understand the reality that they never change, that once they become ours by faith in the gospel, there is an operation that you do that puts us in the Christ and gives us access to all the wonderful things that you have in Christ. Things that we have now learned for quite some time that prepare us for now this time. That by these mercies that we can present ourselves to you. A fascinating thing. A fascinating action that we ought to now take in light of all that we've learned. So Father, I pray that in light of all that we've covered in the book of Romans, stirring that up within us, we would understand the exhortation given to us here by you, and that we would heed it with great responsibility. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ and the riches of your glory that you're making known to us, your vessels of mercy, in this dispensation of your grace in which we live, to your praise, honor, and glory. We give you all the thanks and praise. In Christ's name, amen. amen. I can't say I'm not excited um, to enter into this portion. If you've been with us for six years, coming up on seven, since I began the book of Romans. Um, maybe the, the cat's out of the bag now that Romans 12 is what this is leading up to, everything that we've been dealing with. And Romans 12 specifically, these two verses, is what has prompted me, and as I've shared with the, the elders and deacons over the years, to really make sure we take the time to understand this foundational epistle. Um, this is no small thing in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, the, the presenting of our bodies. As I reflected on this over the past couple weeks in preparation for this time and last night, thinking about it and talking with Michelle about it, this is a very unique thing when he says, present your bodies. If you think about it, these believers at Rome have been believers for quite some time. He has expressed to them, if you've read through this epistle, that their faith has been sounded out. It's gone out into the world, in a sense, that's been heard of. He's expressed that he had wished to be there over a year and, uh, before this, and yet it is now in this epistle, in the 12th chapter, where he expresses to them that they are to present their bodies 
in light of all that he's covered, which, if you think about it, is a curious thing, a peculiar thing, that here these saints at Rome have believed the gospel, and yet it is now by this epistle that he urges them. And there's, that, there's a reason why we're just going to be taking a look, and we're going to be reflecting Oh, maybe review is not a good word. Maybe people like re- review. We're going to be reflecting, stirring up within us all that we should have built up within us, that we've taken the time and that I've tried to accommodate to make sure that when we enter into this text that we don't take it lightly, but we take it with the sense of gravity that we ought to, but to reflect upon these mercies, reflect upon the things that he has, and that in light of that, he says, I beseech you, And we cannot neglect to think that although Paul is our apostle, and we'll look at the I there, but he is speaking on behalf of God, our Heavenly Father. And it is God, our Heavenly Father, who is the one that beseeches. And beseeching is a fabulous Old English word. It is kin to other words like entreat and persuade and these kind of things, but beseech, above all of them, describes an urgent necessity. It is at this juncture in this epistle where now there's an urgent necessity to present our bodies. And it is in reflection of all the things that he has now put forth on the table in regards to the doctrine set forth previous to this, that we are now to present our bodies. This is the only time. This is the only time in Paul's epistles where he uses present this way. He'll talk about it in connection with the present time. He'll use the word in regards to being present with certain saints, that he's not present with them. He talks about it in in connection with the life that is to come. We're absent from the body, and uh, if we're absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. But none of those in connection with 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 a presentation besides the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be a, we present ourselves to Christ. And then after that, he's going to present us to the Father. But never in Paul's epistles does he use that same word in regards to an action we now take in this life. And he doesn't come along and say that when you immediately believe, now you present your bodies. Because you and I are not just to present our bodies any way in which we please or in which we think. It is by the mercies of God. And as he's going to express and as we'll look at, A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Those are all things by God's mercies, by the abundance of grace, of of what we've learned that God did for us and what he's provided to us in Christ, has now given us the opportunity and therefore the urgent necessity, the beseeching to now take the appropriate action in which all those things provide us to be able to do, that is present our bodies. So with that being said, I can't say, I'm not excited, I can't say that it is these two verses that I've kept in the back of my mind for six, almost seven years in regards to this is no small thing. This this is something that I pray to God when we here at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll come along and not in our flesh think, wow, we've taken six years. Who takes six years to go through the book of Romans? And I pray to God that you'll look back at the judgment seat of Christ and say that that was eternally worth it. I don't we as the eldership here, we don't do this to simply just be different. I don't do this simply to be different. I don't do this to somehow get some vainglory to be recognized in some fashion of 
well, going deep into the Word of God or, or something like that. And do it in connection with thinking about our Heavenly Father and the doctrine that He set forth and knowing that as the pastor and teacher, that it is our responsibility as the leadership here to bring you up in the way in which the Word of God prescribes. It is our responsibility to do that. And so it is in light of that that what we're going to do is to reflect upon what we've covered over the course of these years that would impress upon us the very thing that this word beseech denotes. And so maybe what we'll do is we'll start out with a definition of what beseeching is before we reflect upon that. This word is used 67 times in the scriptures. 67 times. 30 times, so almost half, from Matthew through the Revelation. 21 times by Paul. Over 30% of the times in which this word is used, it's used by the Apostle Paul. And there is legitimate reason for that is because of what God had utilized Paul to reveal in connection with things that were only witnessed to in the Old Testament, as well as things that God did not even witness to in the Old Testament concerning the mystery that we've learned now in Romans chapter 11, this mystery, that we, of all believers in God's ages, in God's history, are most privileged because as we've just learned in our text before this last week in Romans chapter 11, he says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord and who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Beloved, we have that. Unlike any other believing uh, believers in God and his messages throughout time, we have the depth of both the riches, of the, of the wisdom and knowledge of God. We, by the help of the intercessory ministry of the Holy Spirit, who searches the deep things of God, that he might reveal them to us, the things that are freely given to us of God, we have that. So the things that were once unsearchable are no longer searchable, and the things that once were searched out but were only witness to, we can now come to fully know the things that were once past finding out, we today can know them. The mind and counsel of God before the foundation of the world, he gives us privy access to. So, in light of that, that builds up to this issue of, I beseech you, therefore. And why, in Paul's epistles, he uses this term, beseech. An urgent necessity to follow what Paul expresses and what our Father exhorts us to do. Now the word by definition is to entreat, to supplicate, to implore. You'll, you'll see the similar thing when Paul says, I pray you. Because it's the issue of to ask or pray with urgency. The etymology of the word, it's, it's com compounded of be and seek, which is, or seek. I beseek. It is intensive verb signifying to seek strongly. This is what our Heavenly Father is now doing. I seek strongly you, therefore, to take a specific action. Beseech is different from its kin terms, it's similar to many of those. Many of those words, supplicate, entreat, implore, ask, pray, have and express a sense of urgency, but above all of them, it is more 
urgent than all the other words. That's how strong of a word beseech is. It is a state of urgent necessity. Therefore, beseech is designed to influence and persuade you. Now with that, I must recall what we've looked at in connection with Romans chapter 8. Just come over there with me. Romans chapter 8. And I want to pick up a phrase that we've become familiar with and we are referencing quite a bit. Just look at the first verse, Romans chapter 8. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now if you can recall, and I'll refresh us, that word after, when you are after something, when you're going after something, you are influenced by it. You have an affection for it. You are being, as, the, as we get down in the further context, he talks about the issue of being led by the Spirit. When the Spirit leads us, he is teaching, and we are to be influenced by his leading, by his teaching, and therefore we walk after it. And here now we have, in Romans chapter 12, you can turn back there, he says, I beseech you. It is now the Father, the Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, writing that's coming along and utilizing a term that reflects the issue that he's now leading us. It's not that he wasn't before, but he's now going to lead us in some certain things and a certain action we are to take now in light of what we've come to know. So the word is to describe, to, is to denote the, that we are to be influenced and persuaded. And beloved, if he comes along and he says, I beseech you therefore, and that's designed to influence and persuade us, that indicates or ought to indicate to us that we need to be influenced. We need to be persuaded. We're not prone to do what follows the beseeching. This is why the emphasis is there. If we are prone to do it, we would just then go about doing it. And so therefore, all the more we need to take heed to this beseeching. One of its kin terms, beseeching, is the word entreat. It's to make an earnest petition or request but beseeching is more urgent our father now now is coming along and is earnestly requesting something of us now at this point and we can't forget whom is educating us, whom is requesting this of us. We must look through the pen of Paul to the Spirit is the one in whom's providing these words, and it's the Spirit of God on behalf of the one in whom he searched, our Father. Therefore, it is our Father who comes along and says, I beseech you, I beseech you. So it is an important and significant thing to look at in regards to I beseech you, the word beseech. And then he says, I beseech you, therefore. Therefore is not just based upon Romans chapter 11. It encompasses everything. And you know that by what he's going to come along and describe in connection with the living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Those are terms that encapsulate certain Things that we've covered and certain things that the Spirit has taught us already in this epistle. And so what I want to do is reflect upon some of those things that now ought to, as we look back, refresh our minds in connection with now all that we've come to know Provide in us, with the Father's exhortation, an urgent necessity to do what he is calling us and requesting us to do, that is, present our bodies. So let's go back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1.
Romans chapter 1. And if you look at the opening few verses, and we're just going to look at verse 4. But he says, I declare to be the Son of and declared to be the Son of God with power, speaking of Jesus Christ, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship. This grace, Paul's going to bring up in verse 3 of our chapter, chapter 12, for the grace given unto me in connection with his apostleship that is standing in the stead of the, for the authority of God our Heavenly Father of I beseech you. And it's in connection with that where he says that it's by the resurrection from the dead. And not only that, but the Son of God with power that Paul has received grace and apostleship. But don't miss those words. It's in, that, in those commas there. He says, according to the spirit of holiness. We learn from the outset here in Romans chapter 1. That God has a certain mind, an essential frame of mind, a spirit of holiness. That's not the issue of that God is holy. It is that he has an essential frame of mind of holiness that we might receive. And there are some things in order for us to benefit from the spirit of holiness that need to take place. Obviously, the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was by the resurrection from the dead that he's now declared to be the son of God with power. And it's this power, therefore, that is in accord to the spirit of holiness. Now, how is this fleshed out? Look at Romans chapter 1, just further on in verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the what? Power of God the power of God and it plays a part in connection with this spirit of holiness that Christ is declared to have the power that is in accord to. Is the power of God unto salvation. And here in the opening chapters of Romans, we learned about the issue of justification. Justification. That power of Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection that provides us to be freely justified by his grace. And Christ, in dying, being buried, and rising again, and declaring to have that power according to the spirit of holiness, one of the first actions is to give us the gospel where which we might believe and therefore become justified. Look at Romans chapter 3. He says in verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He moves on and he talks about the, the issue of faith and justification always by faith and faith alone. And you get down to the end of chapter 4 in verse 24, and he says, but for us also were these things written. To whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our, the things freely given unto us, the Spirit's going to reveal, the Spirit of holiness, for our justification. That when you believe the gospel, you become justified. The transaction takes place. A difference between the provision being made and it being offered to you through the gospel and then receiving it by faith and then God makes the transaction and you become justified. And what happened when we became justified? Chapter 5 and verse 1. This is all leading up to the spirit of holiness. These things therefore needed to take place in order for God to, to do what he wants to do in, in accord with that spirit of holiness where his power lies. 
He says in verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. All of these mercies, this abundant grace that He lavishes to us, upon us, because we believed the gospel. But that's not it. For if that was it, he could just stop at any time. It is now, as one that's justified by faith, we learn about the much more love of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, he talks about, Paul says, Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but in power and love, uh, uh, and, 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 um, uh, in power, and he says, in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. That much assurance comes from Romans chapter 5. Much assurance. Verse 9. Much more than. Verse 8. But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. If he did these things when we were yet sinners, how much more does he love us now being believers? It doesn't stop there. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, the epitome of that much assurance doctrine is verse 11 and onward, that we have received the atonement, that we are at one with Christ. And being at one with Christ and in Christ is not only, verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Not only do we receive the gift of righteousness and therefore are justified of, uh, unto life or justification of life, but we've received abundance of grace. That's why we have access to it. And as we learn further, this grace is abundant. The grace that we have access to by faith is abundant. Beloved, those, that abundant grace we are going to be receiving in Romans chapter 12. It, it's His spirit of holiness that touches and can touch every aspect of our lives to truly not be some theological term, but that can truly transform you. We learn more about this abundant grace in chapter 6 in connection with something that God did, an operation that took place the moment we believed. Chapter 6 Verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And there for the first time in this foundational epistle, we learn about this issue of walking. That we were not only given the gospel and the, the justification was offered to us by grace through faith for the simple fact of being justified unto eternal life and having a standing before God, peace with, uh, peace with God, and, and, and the issue of rejoicing and hope of the glory of God. It's the issue that something else took place the moment we believe. There was an operation, a baptism by the Spirit that took us out of Adam and put us in Christ. That made us dead indeed in the sin and alive unto God. That we might walk in newness of life. And here's where we need to connect it to our text. In presenting our bodies. Even though we'll take more time to look at that once we get there. Is that if we are to walk in newness of life now. What do we have to do that in? Our bodies. But God has to do something inwardly. That he might utilize these bodies that still have sin in it. We might not think of that, but that's part of understanding these things with the eyes of our understanding. The issue of walking by faith and therefore presenting our bodies with those eyes and having that understanding. And so he goes on, verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And he uses the term planted. The way in which this is going to take place, the issue of walking in newness of life, it's going to be a growth process. 
And he's not going to just open up our brains and dump it all in. He is going to progressively reveal it. And therefore we are to progressively go through it. That we might be built up. That we might be transformed into the image of Christ. And what I mean by that is with all specificity. We're not talking about being conformed to the image of Christ in some lovey-dovey term uh, and, and, and some expression in which is, is commonly used and those kind of things that has no background to actually how that takes place and what that looks like. The way in which we know it looks like is what the scriptures give us, the sense and sequence of God's word. When we go through that, and as we go through that, and as we go through that process, we see Christ. We see his image. We see his, his, his character. We see his affections. We see his bowels. We see his mind. We see his love in the very way in which it is in him, but we have to go through that. And so it's going to be a, a development process, a growth process, and the criteria of that process of growth is prescribed for us in the way in which God has provided these epistles, in the order which he's provided them. A farmer doesn't go out and as he's farming his, his land and he's reaping and sowing, there are certain criteria that is prescribed by nature and maybe by certain things in connection with technology advancements and those kind of things that they have to follow in order to get the best crop. Well, it is no different in the scriptures. A teacher who puts a curriculum together for their students has taken the time in not only their own education, but also in thinking about what needs the objectives that are to be accomplished by the end of the year and a certain manner and certain things in which they teach them to bring them along that hope by the end of the year in connection with that grade level, they have come to a, a, a fundamental understanding of those things based upon their grades, A, B, C, D, E, F, whatever it might be. Our Father has, why would it be any different with our Father? If anything, it would be greater. And so it's going to be a development process. And he's going to utilize our bodies in connection with it. Look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. It doesn't mean he destroyed sin. It didn't mean he destroyed our body. It means he severed the relationship that sin had of dominion over our bodies. And it, our bodies are no longer the body of sin. They're his bodies. He's purchased them. He has bought them. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. As the Corinthians were utilizing their bodies for fornication, he reminded them that they are not their own. All the more that we need to reflect upon this, bring it into remembrance in conjunction with the urgent necessity to present our bodies if our bodies are not our own. Look at verse 19 of chapter 6. He says, What? Know, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Presenting our bodies in the way in which he expresses it is the first action that we are urged to take. We are beseeched to take to glorify God. And to use our bodies to do that because we have been baptized in the Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And what it has provided for is to utilize these earthen vessels to his honor and glory. We move on in verse 11. We'll see more of the body connection as we go down. He says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, 
that ye should obey it, that's sin, in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. Presenting is the, the final, the term to express the full measure of action you are now going to take in connection with other things he said previously. Yield. He's going to talk about how the Spirit quickens our moral bodies in chapter 8. But we are to yield. We are to yield ourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And what are we therefore able to do in connection with this new identity? In connection with our, sin, our body no longer being the body of sin? Look at verse 21. It says, what fruit had ye then in those things where ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, your body is no longer the body of sin. You're free from sin. You're dead unto sin. He says, and become servants to God. Our reasonable service, he's going to say at the end of chapter, or verse 1 of chapter 12. He says, ye have your fruit. Unto what? Holiness. Spirit of holiness in Romans chapter 1. And as we go through Romans, you see justification is not the end all be all. Justification is a means in which he can therefore make you fit to walk in the life of his son. And as you walk in the life of his son, as any walk is, there's a starting point and there's an ending point, as it were. And our starting point is Romans 12. It's not that we haven't learned anything. It's not that those things were important. But when it comes to our walk, our actual walk, it's starting in Romans chapter 12. It's the issue of, I'm presenting my body. It's the issue of, of you've, you've gone through the, the training when I was in cross country in high school, I took it because I wanted to build up my endurance for basketball. So while everyone was playing football, I was trying to get better at basketball by taking cross country. And one of the things, when we went to our, our, our meet and we were running the 5K, one of the things we did, we got there really early, and most of the teams did, and you walked. You walked the course. Now this doesn't fit perfectly, but hopefully it gets the point across. All, all the practice that we had done, all the drills, we used to do high knees, you know, high, you know, all these kind of things, so that when you were going down a hill, you would just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hold back, you, just, you would just let your body go, and you needed to have high knees when you would, when you would run downhill. All these drills that, that, that the, the coach is taking you through. And, and, and then when we got there, we would walk that course. We walked the whole thing, and she would point out, and I thought it was kind of silly just because I wasn't really big in the cross country. It was just a means to an end. But for her, it was, it, she's the coach. She's taking you through. So she's, she's like, when you're at this part, you're going to be faster. If you don't go on the dirt, you go on the grass. And you're going you're gonna to help your legs later on in the race. And you're, you're like, what? What does that going to matter? When you, get this, when, you, when you get to this hill, that was another, another thing where you needed the high knees. Get those high knees. When you go down the hill, let, let loose and find that breathing pattern. For me, it was... That's what provided me not to get the side ache and the belly ache. But all of that was preparation. It wasn't until we got to that line and everyone's on that line and the gun went off where then the race was. Everything that we've learned in Romans thus far has been preparatory. It's been going through this. When it's time for you to walk, this is how you're going to walk. This is, this is the provision, the means by, uh, uh, that you can walk. I've made you dead indeed in the sin and alive unto myself. I, I, I've given you the abundance of grace. 
I have severed the relationship of sin in your body that it might be mine and that you might be able to glorify me with it. And here's how you're going to walk. And the, here's the objective. That you might bring fruit unto my holiness. And the end of it is everlasting life. Son, daughter. The end of it is everlasting life. He's going to bring up the issue of running a race over in 1 Corinthians. And he says it's not for a corruptible crown. He says it's for an incorruptible crown. It's because the fruit unto holiness is the only thing that we can participate in this life that touches every aspect of our lives. Don't get, us, don't get me wrong. But the only thing in this life that we can take that benefits not only the life that now is, but the life that is to come. And so he's therefore, through the book of Romans, has taught us all the things, all the work that he's done to put us in this position that now he therefore comes along in educating us about it all, comes along and says, I beseech you. There is now an urgent necessity. This is not only why I made man in the first place, but this is why I sent my son to die for you on that cross. This is why I gave a gospel that you might be justified. Is not only to be content in your justification, for that is not why I provided it for you, but is to bring fruit unto holiness that you might know me through my Son. That we might have a relationship now that is not only profitable for you now, but for the life that is to come. And he went to great, great painstaking obstacles and provisions to do that for us. We're not only free from sin, we're free from the law. That we might be able to do this. He comes to chapter 8. And he gives some phenomenal things. One, that based upon Christ and what Christ did... He says in verse 3, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. You could not fulfill the righteousness of the law by the law. You can fulfill the righteousness of the law by what Christ provided in conjunction with the spirit of holiness. That is going to be the Holy Spirit that teaches us those things of holiness, those things of the Spirit, that when we walk after them, we fulfill what the law can never fulfill, the righteousness of the law. And then he communicated to us. He took us through the course. He took us through, this is how you walk. Verse 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. It should be plainly clear to us, especially as we get in the verse 2 of chapter 12, that you might be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. That he is picking up where he left off in Romans chapter 8. Your walk after the Spirit now begins, son. Present your body, and how you present your body, not only a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, but the way in which you're going to glorify God in your body is by first the renewed mind. That's what makes it go. And when you therefore mind the things of the Spirit, you become spiritually minded, which is life and peace. Verse 6. The Spirit, therefore, dwells in you, not just by way of believing the gospel, but by minding his things that he's teaching you. There's a difference. The, the form of doctrine and the gospel of justification is only one measure of the Spirit. I'm not, I'm not talking about a second blessing or a second giving of the Spirit. That's not what I'm talking about at all. 
I'm talking about when you look at the Spirit and the things that He teaches you, the very first thing that He teaches you is the gospel. He offers it to you. You're to believe it. And then He teaches you some, some things. But there are some things in connection with your walk that you are to mind just as much as you minded the first things. And when you mind those things, the Spirit, by virtue of those things, by virtue of you minding them, dwells within you. Not just permanently dwells, but that by virtue of His things dwell within you. That's what I'm hoping to do. That's what Michelle and I are hoping to do with our children. That we dwell within them. How? Not just that our blood is in them. They're ours. But that our words to them dwell within them. That's something that... I'll just say this to get the point across, although it's not perfect. My, my blood can't do. Just them being mine can't do. Now, they are ours. They are uh, our, uh, our children, and so therefore we can educate them and we can teach them. And justification, being justified by faith through His blood provides us to be educated, but it is the things of the Spirit that we are to mind that by those things we get to be filled with the Spirit by virtue of us going after them, walking after them. And when we walk after them, verse 11, but if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by a Spirit that dwelleth in you. He's not talking about your physical resurrection. He talks about the redemption of their body in verse 23. He's talking about when you mind the things of the Spirit, those things of the Spirit, the Word of God is quick and powerful. The Word of God quickens your mortal body that still has sin in it, and it bypasses that, that you might be able to use this body as you yield it to your Father for His holiness for His righteousness, for His glory. We learn further on in Romans chapter 8 that this is all going to be done in the adult relationship as we have been adopted. We have been adopted to be heirs of God and therefore joint heirs with Christ. And we have been given the privilege to suffer with Christ that we might be glorified together in our joint heirship with Christ. And our glorification in our joint heirship with Christ, if we walk after the Spirit, is not on the kingdom that's here on this earth, but in the creature in the heavenly places. Therefore, not only has he taught us to walk, he's expressed to us the end goal, the purpose. And that purpose is to reconcile the heavenly places, to deliver the creature from the bondage of corruption. And so not only do we get, again, the mechanics of how we are to walk, the provision, how we can do that, because we're justified, we've been baptized into Christ, and all these things, and, that, and, and he's, he's going to express that we have the helping ministry of the Holy Spirit, and he's going to reveal those things that he searched the Father of, the deep things of God. We know that from what he says in chapter 8. We know that as we got down to chapter 11 is that this is what our purpose is, and to make sure that that is solidified in our minds, he's taken three chapters in Romans 9, 10, and 11 to express to us that he is not done with Israel, although they are blind right now, in part. And they're accursed from Christ. And we have been grafted in to Israel's olive tree that was that was uh, revealed to them and promised to them those spiritual things in the New Testament that one, we might benefit from those things because those spiritual things in the New Testament is the spirit of holiness. It's the spirit, as he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And so we, therefore, get access to that, but not for Israel's purpose but for his mystery purpose. And in light of all that, once again, 
I'll read verse 33 of Romans 11. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who hath known the mind of the Lord and who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Those things, and those are, that's, that's just a 50 minutes, 50 minute run through of things that we've covered that are to impress upon our minds and our hearts that truly of him and through him and to him are all things. And by the revelation of his wisdom and knowledge and his unsearchable judgments and ways and making known his mind and his counsel, he gets glory. His glory, therefore, is forever. And putting us in a position not only in Christ, but a dispensational position for his mystery purpose. He says, I beseech you, therefore. There is then an urgent necessity and request that comes from our Father, not me. Not me, not anyone who stands behind a pulpit, not any member of the body of Christ, although we might be a vessel to express by words this beseeching. This comes from our Heavenly Father. It's as if He was standing before you and He says, I beseech you, therefore, I have a petition and request upon you and for you. He says that by my mercies, you present your body unto me. And you present your body unto me the way in which I provided you to present it. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. And he says, this is reasonable. This is your reasonable service. Why is it reasonable? One, because all his mercies that he's done, and to present it in this specified manner, a living sacrifice, holy, and acceptable, as, you go, as we'll go through them, you'll see those are things that he's already done for us. And it's in the light of that, then, therefore, we present our bodies. So if, he's, if he came along and he says, I, wanna I, wanna, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, and yet he didn't make us dead indeed on the sin, dead, yet alive, a living sacrifice, then that would be unreasonable. But he says, I provided everything for you, for you to present the way in which I'm asking you to present yourself. It's reasonable. And it's a beseeching. It's not a command. He's not looking at it as you owe me this when we owe him everything. He's saying, I'm, I'm urging you to do this. I want you to do this. I'm not forcing you. He's never forced anything upon any man. But he wants you to, to, to evaluate. He wants you to examine. He wants you to look at these things that oftentimes we take too much for granted. And he says, present yourselves to me. I'm not going to force you. You've got you to do it. But I've taught you and I've taught you things in which you can do it this way. And the question is then, are you going to do it? It was the same question as the Romans were. And by the way, as this takes place, I don't believe it's just a one-time deal. If it was a one-time deal, I think the Corinthians, obviously, therefore, then got it wrong. We just saw over there in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he says, glorify God in your bodies. This might be coming along and for the very first time putting this on the table of the saints at Rome. But it's a continual thing that we are to do. It's a continual thing to stir up within us that we can be a living sacrifice because we're dead and dean on the sin, uh, dead and dean on sin, alive unto God. We can present our bodies holy because He specifically set us apart in a peculiar manner that is as His adopted sons and daughters. Not as children under the law, 
but in a privileged relationship that he held out for those that essentially would benefit from the New Testament, whether it be Israel's program or whether it be us, and acceptable. That we are persuaded and fully persuaded that nothing is going to separate us and that we are not fulfillers of Israel's program, that he has a purpose with us. And when we do that, we constantly keep ourselves reminded and stir up within us who we are in Christ, who we are as his sons and daughters, and what our service is unto and for. And as we do that, that becomes the life-constraining force to propel us forward when the going gets tough. When you give yourselves, when you restrain sin because you're dead and dealing with sin, and you begin to bring forth fruit unto holiness, which by the way, as we're going to learn, is through godly charity, which is thinking of others more than yourself, and you're constantly giving and giving and giving, and your whole life is consumed of giving to others, and no one recognize it. No one gives you honor. No one gives you praise. And they come along and it's like they want more and more and all these other situations in which there doesn't seem to be any fellowship or any relationship. And, and, and you're just giving, giving, giving and it's tough and tough. And you come along and you got to think it's not for man. It's for the honor and glory of my Father. Amen. It's for His purpose. And when you come along and you start wondering and questioning, am I doing this of myself to refresh yourself of who you are in Christ? You're dead indeed in the sin, alive to God. Therefore, the very things that we've learned, although it might be years since we've touched them as far as from the pulpit, they are to comprise who you are and comprise your life of the, the, the doctrine in which you built up within you that you live in and out of. How do you unleash what you built up within you? One, if you got to go back, you go, you got to go back in prayer. By this juncture in Romans, we've barely touched prayer. I've touched it at a few points to help you to understand that prayer is first and foremost not the issue of making all these requests to God to get but to bring into remembrance the very things that he's already given you in Christ that are the power for you to live the way in which he has died on the cross for you to live. That's a whole different perspective of prayer. One is usually completely, even when there's a necessity, selfish. And the other one is looking at what you already have and allowing it and yielding it, yielding to it to motivate you to do with it what it says to do with it. And so this beseeching, this urgent necessity is again so important, so important. So let's begin to talk about the mercies of God and we'll just introduce this and then we'll have our break. He says, I beseech you, therefore, therefore, in light of all that he's taught you, all that we've gone through, he urges us now, he beseeches us, brethren. By the way, he talks about Christ, that we're conformed to his image, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. This is whom we are. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are placed in Christ that we might be conformed to his image for the prospect and hopes that if we walk after the Spirit, we'll be glorified together in our inheritance. He says, by the mercies of God. These mercies of God are the means of what he's beseeching us to do. He could have just came along and said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, present your bodies a living sacrifice. But oftentimes he does this so that we might know 
that our sufficiency is not of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And therefore, our presenting is not a, pre a presentation of our bodies out of our flesh. It is a presenting our bodies by the mercies of God. Now, he's going to give three of those mercies. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Those are terms in which the mercies of God allow us to present our bodies a certain way, this, this, in this manner. I was thinking about that term, and I already expressed the uniqueness of it here in this text, in our context. But oftentimes when you think about pre present, I think about presentation, I think about a, a, a play or a, a, of sorts. And when you have a play, there's the, the auditions and the, and the casting. It's, it's what you've trained in your own time, or um, maybe you didn't have time to train it, but you, you went, you, you casted for the position, you auditioned for the position. And then they come along, and based upon that addition, they come along and say, you got the part. Do they go right to the play? What do you have next? Rehearsal. Rehearsal after rehearsal after rehearsal. And there's the dress rehearsal, and there's the, the getting all the, doing rehearsal with all the background and the, tool, the tools and, the, and the, um, the, the, back, um, the scenes and the sets and all these kind of things. And then the big night comes. Folks, our big night doesn't come until the life that is to come. Our life now, as we patiently wait, is rehearsal. But it's not vanity. It's exercising us for the life that is to come. He talks about godliness, exercises. It's exercising us for that life to come. And therefore, we present ourselves. It's, it's, the, it's the issue of, by God's grace, by His mercies... We've already got the part. We've already got the part. Now we are entering into the next phase, the rehearsal. We're going now into the rehearsal. And the rehearsal, the lines and the words that are being said are the same lines and the same words, because there's a script, that are in the actual play. But there's the issue of forgetting and there's the issue of the failures there's the issue of I'm not where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there's the issue of I, uh, um, I went the wrong way or the or, or my the dress rehearsal to make sure the, the gowns and the garb is all uh, right for that night and all these kind of things to to go through that so there's a fluency when the play comes when that big night comes and I spring up that analogy to help impress upon you is, although we're going to be going through this rehearsal time, don't think that God has cut us short in regards to the very things that we are handling. For the very things we are handling are of Him. They're the things of the Spirit. They're just, we're just in this time of preparation for the life that is to come. So we are to present our bodies. And the reason why I say that is because of the other times in which he uses this term. Um, come with me to, uh, come over with me to uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. We won't look at all these right now, but I just want to bring this up. Ephesians chapter 5. We were just here in our family series, but look at verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might, what? Present, Present it to himself a glorious church. Our presenting now is that we might be presented that way later. He's not just talking about justification here. Justification, he would have said justification. He says that he might sanctify and cleanse it. He says over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, having there, verse 1, having therefore these promises to the beloved, he says, 
cleanse yourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the, and of the spirit. And he says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We cleanse ourselves based upon the promises of God, based upon the promises of, that we have in the scriptures. We are able to cleanse, our, cleanse ourselves. It's God's provision of cleansing. It's God's provision of sanctifying. And in that, he's going to present it to himself a glorious church. Not just a church, but a glorious church. Why? Because when we're there, it's the issue of that we have been sanctified. We have been cleansed. Not just the issue of being baptized in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's the issue of our walk after the Spirit that cleanses, that sanctifies, that edifies, that grows us. And the whole judgment seat of Christ is essentially for that to be made sure it's done when he presents the church to the Father. Is that any, anything of the flesh is burnt up and anything that is of the Spirit or anything that is, is built upon that right foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, is rewarded. It's adorned with glory. And so we have our rehearsal. We present ourselves in the rehearsal that we might be presented this way. And again, our sufficiency isn't of ourselves, but it's of God. It's the Word of God. The washing of water by the what? By the Word. How is the Spirit, what's the Spirit's medium to wash us? That is, by the Word. By the Word of God. It started when we believe the Gospel. Paul says over there in second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but you're, you're, you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You are justified in the name of our God and, and, and our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. We, we've, been, we've already been washed as we've been baptized in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. But there's a continual washing by his word as we grow in the, in the doctrine. So we present ourselves now that we might participate in the sanctifying, cleansing, washing process by the word of God, by the things of the spirit as we live after him. That we might be presented later a glorious church. We are the church. But to be presented a glorious church. Come back to Romans chapter 12. And what we are going to be presenting is our bodies. These earthen vessels, these mortal bodies that he's already expressed. He's going to utilize these bodies for his purpose, for his will. To express his power, to express his wisdom... And the fact that he can bring forth fruit unto holiness, even though we still have sin in our mortal bodies. Well, we'll look at more in the next session. Let's pray to conclude. Father, we thank you for this time of looking at your word. What a privilege it is, Father, to be, seached, to be beseeched by you. To be sought out after in connection with all that you provided for us in Christ. And may we, therefore, understand the urging and the petition and the request that you have of us in light of all that you've done for us in Christ, knowing that you're not going to force it upon us, but you will express the urgent necessity we have to utilize all that you've given us in Christ for your service. And therefore, may we respond in like fashion, not only at the first now, but continually throughout our days to remind ourselves of what you've done with us in Christ, not only positionally, but dispensationally. I thank you for everyone here. I thank you for this assembly and the absolute privilege that we get to partake in as Paul wrote this epistle to impart upon those at Rome and therefore impart upon us some spiritual gift to the end that we might be established. And the reality being that there's more outside this epistle. Father, may we therefore begin to really esteem and value the spirit, the mind, the Holy Spirit and what he's going to teach us here in this passage. 
the newness of life that this is here in Romans chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And begin to understand that it is these things that we are to build up in us and live in and out of. We thank you for your son. The gift of righteousness that he extends to us by his death, burial, and resurrection. If someone has not received that gift, may they receive it by faith and faith alone, trusting that Christ died for their sins on the cross, was buried, and rose again. The moment they do, they'll receive the forgiveness of sins and your righteousness, and they'll possess the gift of eternal life. And we thank you for the abundance of grace, Father, that by that you now urge us. May we take heed to our response. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.